Good evening, everybody. It's Mayor Shelley Brindle, and we are here for another Facebook Live to provide more information uh, on the One Westfield Place proposed uh, project for our downtown. I, tonight, our focus is on the planning design uh, behind One Westfield Place. And be, I am joined by several town and street work professionals along with some of their architects who I will be introducing in a bit. But I first um, just wanna give a few caveats about what we're, what, what we're gonna be sharing and discussing tonight. So um, th these folks are gonna be taking you through um, the, some of the planning process led by our town planner, Don Samet, which led to the proposal that we are all contemplating today. Um, and it's also tonight, these, these, what we're talking about is meant to be conceptual. Um, we're gonna be providing insights and context into what is, um, is being proposed. Uh, and, you know, and want to just provide some reassurance to everybody that, um, you know, the, it's all going to be done in keeping and with the context and character of the town of Westfield that we know and love. They're going to be sharing information about architecture, scale and facades, and how it will be contextual to Westfield and will not change the fundamental character of our town. We are not and we never will be Hoboken or Jersey City. Westville is and will always be a predominantly single family residential community. And this proposal that we're contemplating tonight will not change that. And I think that will become clearer as the, as the evening moves on. I do wanna just remind everybody about the process. It's just important to remember that the specific details of this project ultimately related to important items like architectural details such as materials and windows and signage and lighting and those kinds of things will all be determined ultimately by the planning board during site plan or site plan review. So um, so what I just want to remind everybody this is not final design. You'll hear a lot about that tonight. This is really is contextual stuff. And just uh, finally on questions. Um, so even though we're on Facebook Live, this is actually a Zoom that's being presented on a Facebook Live because you can't do Facebook Lives with people from different locations. So as a result, we're not able to see the questions that are put up in the comment section on the Facebook Live, but we do have people who are watching it that are feeding us those questions. So if you have questions, um, please uh, put them in the comments. And if we haven't covered them, we will hopefully get to them later in the end, but please keep them specific to planning and design. That's the focus tonight. And I just worry about time constraints we probably won't have time to delve into things that are not related into tonight's discussion. So, um, so please, uh, thank you for joining us. Again, uh, this is being recorded and it will be posted on the Town of Westfield page website. Uh, you do not need to have Facebook ultimately to view it. So uh, it, it'll, it'll be up there as all our other ones have been. So anybody can come back and, and rewatch it or watch it for the, for the first time. Uh, and I think it'll be posted tomorrow. So with that, We'll get started and I'll make some introductions. Who's driving that presentation? So, Josh and Kate, yep. All right, okay, great. Um, terrific, so I just wanna see if we can go on to the next page. And so this is really gonna be the overview for this evening. Uh, we've got our town planner, Don, Don Samet. Hopefully most of you are familiar with Don at this point. He has an amazing pedigree. We're very lucky to have him and has done major incredible work in, uh, in uh, uh, Asbury Park and Montclair and other places. So, and he's been, he, we're very, we're thrilled to have him. He's gonna talk about kind of the master plan and the town goals. Uh, many of you hopefully are now familiar with Doug Adams, um, who's the Senior Vice President of Development at Streetworks. He's gonna be joining us to talk about some of the project. Richard Heaps, who many of you know, one of the co-founders of Streetworks, is going to talk about also what led into some of the proposal and Ann Landau, Landau is their senior planner, and she'll be taking us through some of the specifics. We're being joined by their architect, um, Harry Pleltz from Buyer, Blinder, and Bell. Um, he's going to go through the design strategy and process, and hopefully many of you uh, are familiar with their, um, with their firm. I know some folks are Horse Historic Preservation Commission were, they're one of the preeminent architectural firms that specialize in historic preservation. So very lucky and thrilled that they're on this project. And lastly, Chris Colley, Chris Colley from Topology, that rhymes, Chris, um, who ultimately, hopefully you guys are familiar with at this point. He's our redevelopment planning consultant and he is gonna take us through the process and what happens uh, to get to the approval process. So with that, I think I am turning it over to you, Don. 
You're on mute, Don. There we go. It wouldn't be a Zoom call without that. It wouldn't be without a, you're, you're on mute. Um, so take it away. Okay. Well, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you this evening as a planner, particularly, really because we get to discuss what really has its genesis in a significant amount of master planning work that's taken place over recent years. Um, for me and, and others, it's really something that started back in 2018 when we started looking for a consultant to help us play, prepare a re-examination report for Westfield. Now, back at that time, we have to remember that the last re-examination report for Westfield was conducted in 2009, and the last major master plan update was in 2002. So we were due for another look at what was happening in town, what our policy was land use wise in town. Now, all of the master planning work we did, and I'm gonna talk a bit about the re-examination as well as the updated uh, unified land use and circulation element of the master plan. All of that master planning work has really provided the policy direction for the one Westfield Place initiative we're discussing. Um, you know, when I was thinking about what I would say this evening, I actually watched a YouTube video from February of 2019, and you can find this video on the town YouTube page, and it's where uh, Mayor Brindle, then Planning Board Chair Bob Newell, and myself, we talked about the importance of the master plan re-examination process that at that point had just begun. I forgot we did that, Don. We did that, yeah. That's right. I, I remember um, that now. It was it was fun. That was um, yeah, we were sitting around yeah. the table, but you can watch I remember. it. Remember, uh, it was Robert. God bless him. So we we emphasized and we spoke about the importance of public engagement, what we were doing, the importance of a master plan to the community, and again, of course, with with an emphasis on the reexamination report because that is the the report that we had uh, just begun. So, you know, what is this master plan re-examination? We've talked a lot about it in town. You know, why did we do it? A re-examination is really a review of existing planning policies, planning documents, ordinances, which, as I mentioned for us, included the town master plan, which was last comprehensively updated in 2002, and a look back at what's cha had changed since the last re-examination report in 2009. We looked at what we like about our community, where we thought there might be room for improvement. In essence, we were looking to update the town's vision, update the town's goals. Um, there was an extensive public outreach and participation process, and, and boy, the public came out, right? People talk about the survey numbers, and but what um, hasn't been mentioned too much recently is how many meetings uh, were held. And there's a graphic on the slide here showing all the community engagement that took place. And this doesn't even include the, the planning board hearing where the master plan re-exam was adopted. Um, I remember um, H2M uh, remarking how, for them, it was the greatest level of public involvement they had ever seen. So they were very pleased with the results and we were pleased with what they were able to, to, to get from the community. Um, so, I think I should emphasize that I, I see this really, it was a community-driven re-examination report. It wasn't just some academic exercise where the plan, where the planning board formed the subcommittee, staff sat, sat with that subcommittee and looked at you know, what they felt changed. And no, this was a community-driven plan. I, I myself really see the re-examination as being authored, authored by the public, um, defining what the public wants to see is the next steps for Westfield, or, or put another way, like a, a course of action for future planning efforts or a roadmap. Hey, Don, pardon me yes. for interrupting, but yeah. can you explain, um, the town had never done a process like that previously, right? Like the, Not how to my this, knowledge, no. How was this process, from what I understand, was very different than any of the master plan process previously, which very didn't different. involve, which did not involve the public. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my understanding in 2009 re-examination, for example, was a planning board subcommittee working with um, planning department staff, town planning department staff to put it together. And it really, it, it met the statutory requirements, but it didn't have the public outreach process apart from the, the public hearings um, that, that we went through in 2018 and 2019, I should say, 
to put together our current reexamination. And and to be clear, that's not uncommon, correct? That that it's, no, it's, a, not it's a process of the planning board and subcommittee. Is that I just that's right? To yeah, there's no people. there's no requirement to have uh, public outreach. It, it's required to be adopted at a public meeting, but there's no requirement that you form steering committees or hold meetings with. Uh, senior citizen population, or business owners, or property owners, or or different uh, different groups in town. Um, so what Westfield did was really, I think at the time I described it as like master plan plus, like we went so far beyond what was uh, required by just the law, and um, really that was something that we wanted to do. Um, there was a, a great emphasis on getting the public um, to come forward and tell us what they wanted, right? It wasn't just a group of people sitting around the table and figuring it out. It was a public driven plan. And from there, it's really up to the staff, the planning board, the governing body to bring what the public says, what the public's vision, what the public goals are, bring those forward to fruition, right? So, in that sense, the re-examination was an action plan for us. So what, what came out or what was contained in that re-examination plan? Well, there's a lot, but what were some of the land use and housing recommendations? Address underutilized and vacant sites, right? No, no surprise there. Encourage redevelopment, including municipal owned lots. Encourage transit oriented development. And there's a whole section that talks about that, but what is transit oriented development? It's basically creation of communities with a mix of uses that provide housing, jobs, services, all with access to different modes of transportation. It can be a car, it can be a bike, it can be the bus, it can be a train, multiple modes of travel. And for us, that was all around our train station. Um, the re-exam specifically calls out municipal and parking lots, Lord and Taylor properties as redevelopment opportunities. It talks about permitting mixed uses on the same site and in the same building. It talks about um, allowing for additional height or density with uh, step backs of upper stories in a way where the intent is to um, not take away from the scale or feeling of our existing downtown, but also protect the residential areas of our community from additional multifamily developments. Um, there's a whole land use section in the re-examination and there's, there's a lot in there. So of course, I'm just giving a very sort of bird's eye view of all this. But one thing for me as a planner, which came out from the re-exam and, and I'll say most importantly, or that may be a disservice to everything else that's in the re-exam is that the re-exam recommended the creation of a unified land use and circulation element to the master plan. So why is this so important? Why do I say most importantly, this is what came out? Um, there were quite a few recommendations for downtown as we see in the graphic uh, on the slide. It's sort of that light blue color. And it talks about um, what the drafting of a land use and circulation plan, which would become an element of our town master plan. And I'll explain the difference in a second, what we should look at. What is our next step? what do we take, need to take a deeper uh, dive into? And we need to address these issues in this box here, those bullet points in a comprehensive and more detailed manner. So if we could just go to the, to the next slide. So the planning board took on this task to create this unified or integrated land use and circulation plan. Now, I just wanna say, this is where I'm gonna just explain a bit about the difference between a master plan and the re-examination. A master plan is a distinctly different document from a master plan re-examination report, right? The, our unified land use and circulation element of the master plan is clearly guided by the work done in the re-examination. Where the re-examination report is really a review of existing policy with some recommendations, it's the master plan itself that is the policy in the sense that it becomes a principal document that addresses the manner, the locations in which uh, development should occur. You know, the master plan isn't just some pretty looking report which sits on a shelf. 
It is the fa- it's the fa- I can't stress this enough. It is the foundation for every land use policy, ordinance, and plan in the town of Westfield and any town in New Jersey for that matter. So the law requires that zoning ordinances, that redevelopment plans be consistent with the master plan or designed to effectuate the master plan. So what's provided in our town master plan, and we're talking about unified land use and circulation element right here, it provides us with the policy direction for what, for development and for development regulation. Um, Our master plan, the unified land use circulation element, uh, took a deep dive into the downtown area. And downtown was broken down into different sub areas. And the map on the slide um, shows what those sub areas are. Each of them had their own, has their own recommended development vision. And in this master plan element, we see a further refinement of what was initially recommended in the re-examination. The land use circulation plan talks about increasing allowable building heights, including the entirety of the CBD to four stories. Um, A lot of people I don't think realize that. Permitting greater heights along the rail line and in redevelopment areas with setbacks or step backs for upper floors from floors below. Recommends mixed use development, creation of public spaces, public plazas, visually screening automobile parking from pedestrian areas, streetscape improvements, locating office and residential uses on the Lord and Taylor site where residential uses aren't permitted there per existing zoning. So again, why is having all this in the land use and circulation element of our master plan so important? Well, this is the roadmap for us to follow. Um, Those that live and work here, staff, planning board, governing body, developers of all size, whether it's a homeowner putting an addition onto their home or street works proposing a project which encompasses multiple sites. All of this is to be consistent with what the master plan um, states or, or apply, how, how it applies to their property. And really that's what Streetworks has to do here. Um, I remember in an earlier meeting with Streetworks, uh, Richard Hebes from Streetworks said, wow, basically he said that we know what you're looking for. You know, we don't have to figure all this out on our own. We have sort of the guide for what you would like to see in your community. So Streetworks has to follow the master plan. And that's what all of us on the town side check for. It's going to be our governing body through adoption of this plan and any redevelopment agreement they may provide. It's for town uh, staff professionals to check on as we're working to draft regulations for the, the redevelopment of these sites. And it's what, very importantly, the planning board's role is in the process for the adoption of any redevelopment plan. They have to ensure that that plan is consistent with the town master plan. So, I mean, it's sort of four years, three three years of, of work I'm kind of talking about, but um, it's a lot, but I think it sets up sort of how we got to where we are. Hey, Don, hey, Don, I just want to interrupt real quick because this is really great information. And actually, it's, you brought back a lot of memories. I'm like, right. I remember when we did the unified land use and circulation element, what a big deal that was. And the fact that we were doing it together with the re-exam, which right. you said was not too many municipalities do that. And it was really fantastic that we were doing them together. Uh, yeah, a couple of things the other, right. Go, right. Just in, yeah. Which was great. A couple of things I just want to follow up. One question came on just came in about density. Um, Can you reiterate, and there's another thing that you said too, which I think is lost on people when you said about the recommendations for four stories. So talk a little bit, was that a recommendation for four stories where uh, in town? And what was the actual recommendation for us to draw the conclusion that we were comfortable with higher density in the downtown? Sure. Okay. So for the four stories, um, the four stories actually goes back a while. It it goes back to, um, well, I'm sure it's been discussed for quite some time, but the first written um, discussion of it I found uh, was from the mayor's downtown task force report. I think that was dated 2017, where it said the town should consider four stories. Um, and it was really a reflection of um, 
uh, the desire for, I say, more uh, residential units downtown to help drive foot traffic and get more folks into to stores and restaurants and, and uh, availing themselves of the services that are available. Um, but there was also, uh, with the four stories, there was a careful consideration that we keep the scale and character of the downtown, so we want to step back that fourth story. Much like we're talking um, here with the, the Streetworks um, uh, development, where we want step backs of, of upper stories to help maintain the scale um, uh, from the street of our, um, or the streetscape of our downtown. And I'm sorry, Mayor, the second part of your question? Was... It's just related to density. Like, how, what conclusions were we able to draw in terms of being comfortable with more density in our downtown um, from the from the results from the surveys or however else we drew those conclusions or the planning board. Sure. Well, it was um, again to um, uh, to to get more folks downtown to avail themselves of goods and service. We were we, but even more so than that. I'll say that we heard a desire for various housing types, right? We're primarily a detached single family residential community. We heard a lot from um, empty nesters. We heard from folks that were looking to move back to town. We heard from seniors that once they were ready to move out of their single family home and they wanted to stay in town, there really wasn't an option for them, right? So. We thought that additional folks in the downtown area would help fill some of those gaps in our housing need. And Don, and, and one more, one last question before we yeah. move on, um, because I know a lot of people are putting almost exclusive weight on the survey results and the meeting results, which is important, but right. it's also directional. And there's a lot of other professionals that weigh in on on that. Correct. So it's that's right. We, it's not exclusively driven by public input. There's a lot of, again, professionals, planning board and so forth that weigh in to really shape the finality of the recommendations. That's very true. And we we'll also think about what this, we have a unified land use and circulation plan. So we're taking a look at, or we've taken a look at both land use and how transportation is impacted because they're also, they're so intercoordinated, right? So you can say you, you want this, but if it doesn't work traffic wise, it, it, it not going to be worth it. So that's why we've taken this coordinated approach to the planning process. Thank you. Okay. Um, with, with that, I guess, um, I think I'm handing it over to uh, either Doug or Ann from Streetworks. Uh, Doug, yeah, thanks, Don. <clears throat> uh, we can go forward a couple of slides, um, one more. Um, when we started on this, which was in 2018 and 2019, um, the master plan that Don just spoke to was really critically important to us because it's a document that we often find in communities uh, we're involved with uh, that is dated, um, doesn't involve any community input, uh, or doesn't exist in many places. So having one that um, was this thorough and this recent um, was great news for us because it provides a look forward and provides real guidance on what um, a town or a municipality is looking for. And in this case, it further aligned almost directly with uh, where our, I guess I'll call the soul of our company and our expertise is, which is in mixed use development and transit oriented development. And, you know, so we set to work on that and I think quickly, even before that, we had realized that the idea of our site being redeveloped as just more retail um, was not the way forward, particularly in light of the community, uh, the business world uh, entirely. So um, we embarked on a plan that includes residential, office, um, medical, um, and uh, street retail. And um, you know we do that by looking at our property, where it is, and also the market at large. And the, there's no question to us that there's a shortage in New Jersey and a shortage in Westfield of housing, as Don spoke to, 
for people that sell their single family home, want to remain in town, but don't have anywhere else to go. And we feel that there's a, a great market there. And combined with the affordable housing that's included under the New Jersey laws, that that, that is a winning uh, combination. <laughs> the office, and I know a lot of people have brought up the office, and I encourage folks to go on our um, website and, and the town's website and, and listen to our presentation on Next Generation Office. We're really bullish on that long term because we see some trends that we think play right into this uh, proposal in Westfield. There's a flight to quality in office, um, and that includes a flight from downtown urban city offices to a more balanced approach approach cost, uh, companies are taking where they are including suburban offices that are closer to where their employees work and allow them to attract more employees and get them um, into the office more, which is important. Uh, the hybrid work uh, is the way uh, forward. The problem in New Jersey is that 85% of the office stock in New Jersey was built before 1990. That is over 30 years old and 75% was built before 1980. I use the comparison, it's, it's getting to the point where a lot of this office stock uh, is like the office stock of the 50s that didn't have air conditioning and they became unleasable. And there are the companies of today that are booming in New Jersey, the biotech, the medical, the consulting firms do not want that type of office. And we think, again, because of the walkable downtown, which is a key component for companies, that locating that office uh, at the railroad station uh, is, uh, again, a, a very strong um, uh, opportunity. <laughs> to give some just quick perspective, the town of Cranford has 839,000 square feet of office space. That's a town of 24,160 people, give or take. Um, Westfield has 118,000. So we think there is a great opportunity here, and it's part of what also drives people downtown and working um, and spending money in the businesses downtown. So Again, just circling back around to the master plan, we think it was a, just a, a great document for us. Uh, and it's something- hey, that, I'm sorry, Doug, I'm gonna interrupt yeah. just before you get, because this is sure. another question came in about this and this office space is something that people really have a hard time, I think, appreciating mm -hmm. in light of you know what they might read about office trends. So um, I I just want to remind it's, uh, everybody that nothing would, you would not begin construction until things were 50% leased with a yeah. tenant. I imagine, you know, that you wouldn't be moving this forward if you didn't already have some sense of kinds of tenants or potential tenant interest based upon uh, your expertise in the market. But one of the questions that came up is, you know, if you don't get it, what's to prevent you from, you know, turning this mass, uh, turning it into apartments? And I just, if anybody watched the finance presentation, the all three of them, two on Facebook Live and one at the council meeting, it says, um, we have conditions in place that they cannot make any changes to their office space in terms of use without express permission from the council. They have to go back, or the governing body, they have to go back and get permission. Um, and by the way, the same thing holds true for 55 and over apartments, it's deed restricted. So those changes can't be made because uh, I think people are worried about more residential and school impact. So I just wanted to um, reiterate that and just also re remind everybody to watch the presentation that you did on office space that's on your website and ours to give everybody a little bit more detail into the market and why you are bullish on it. Great, thank you. Yeah, we we uh, absolutely will have pre-leasing. We feel very confident and um, uh, based on uh, things we're already hearing and seeing in the market and our own experience uh, uh, wider uh, on that. And you're right, we, we understand completely that any changes to that would have to come all the way back through public approval process that's at the discretion of, of the town and, and the council. Um, and, so with, and I do want to remind everybody that we're the apart, 55 and over rentals we're talking about, not purchase, and everything is rentals at the moment. Planned, correct. And the town legally cannot determine and tell you whether you can rent or get it to own. So I just want everybody to know. <laughs> yeah. And we, we build uh, our rental product to for sale standards, I call it. So uh, depending on the market and the, the really the strong desires of the market, we start at uh, the rental as our component, because again, we don't differentiate the quality of the product, but it is 
um, a more stable, financeable, um, uh, conservative way to underwrite the project. And if it goes, um, if the market says it, it really should be for sale, that's always an option. Uh, but we never want to have to pivot the other way. So we, we start with the most conservative underwriting. Um, with that, I'm um, to talk a little bit more and, and really begin to dive into the, what this is about, which is the architecture, I'll stop speaking, is Richard Heaps, one of the co-founders mm -hmm. of Streetworks Development. Uh, thank you, Doug. If I could have the next slide very quickly. My name is Richard Heaps. I am the head of planning and design at Streetworks at HBC. I founded the company, oh geez, I don't know, uh, at, at the end of last decade, last century actually. And the purpose of the company as I founded it was to great, create great places that people love. I don't know if that's a metric for most developers, but that's my metric. How do we make wonderful places? And we've usually found that where you have a wonderful place, it's usually successful, particularly when people love it. So in the case of West Hartford, or excuse me, Westfield, uh, our first and foremost consider are things like making sure it's still walkable and it's a walkable community and that everything we do encourages that and enhances it. Uh, our history, next slide, of course, goes back to Lord and Taylor taking over the icon in Westfield, the old Han and Company department store. And we are very well aware and proud of and love the fact that that's an icon in Westfield. And it's where everyone got their prom dress or met Santa Claus for the first time. These are not small things to us. Uh, they're a general uh, foot in the community. But we want to take that goodwill and push it forward in terms of what we do and how we do it. Uh, if you look at the next slide, here's a slide of a few projects around the country that I've done for the past 40 years. We've been doing this for almost 40 years now. No, these don't look like Westfield. So those of you saying, oh my God, we don't want that, whatever else, well, you won't have it. What you're going to have and the way we do this is to carefully consider and work and talk, and most importantly, listen to what are the important things uh, that a community feels about itself and its environment. We are in the process of doing that now and learning about that now. So I hope you'll understand that your input and your feedback and your questions and concerns are all going into this thing we call uh, One Westfield Place. And that's where we're at now. I only show you these because tip, and I've done probably 10 of these in the last 40 years. I've done 10 that got built. There's a few that haven't uh, because this is what Streetworks loves. This is what we're all about. It was a fantastic uh, notion when HBC purchased my company and all my staff and folks in 2019, which is when we first came to Westfield. And lo and behold, I see this thing, the master plan and re-exam. And I'll be very honest, it blew me away. I've done this 40 years in all sizes of cities I, and towns. I've never had anyone hand me a document like that. So I was bullish, felt like we had a leg up to get started thinking about this. But that was only then. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, the real issue that we look for is great places that people love. We call that an address. We think you can't really have a successful town without a successful downtown. That's that's our feeling. Whether it's true or not remains to be seen. And they have and a Rich, yes. Richard, can I just tell a quick story about you with that? Uh, because um, I've told it to others, but um, I, you know, I've been very open about my early conversations with Richard Baker, and he had this very, very grand vision for the Lord and Taylor property. And it was so grand, I was worried it was going to come at the expense of our downtown and shift the gravity of our downtown to your site because, you know, parking was accessible, retail, it was, you know, the shiny new object. And I told him that when I met with him. And then later on, after he ultimately acquired Streetworks, I think it was your first meeting with me. That's and he right. said, you know that plan that Richard Baker shared with you? I said, yeah. He said, I told him to scrap it. 
because if the entire downtown wasn't set up to be successful, there is no point in making that investment on the Lord and Taylor property. So I think that's when it was really aligned about our interests were aligned in terms of how we can leverage the opportunity on the Lord and Taylor property to benefit the downtown holistically and not just you. And I was and grateful that you, Richard, in particular, came in and recognized that right away. Well, I do remember that, and it's very interesting. Uh, we would not be having this same plan if we were not at least partially involved in the downtown area around the train station. That's what drives this plan. And as it says on this slide, uh, you have to have a cohesive public realm of sidewalks and parks and whatever else uh, to pull a plan together to make a great place. That's our belief. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. One of the things you're going to see, and not, but not hear so much about uh, in this presentation, is the collection of public spaces in downtown Westfield that will help make the downtown greater. We're very passionate and commitment about it. Everywhere, everything from updating Quimby to be more permanent. Uh, creating a new town square here, which you see in front of the train on the north side, or a new town green on the south side, or a North Avenue place in front of Lord and Taylor. We do believe that first and foremost, that's how you add to and make better what is already a great town. So uh, what we're gonna do tonight is I'm gonna invite my colleague, Ann Landau. She's the person actually working on this day-to-day, -day, dotting the I's, crossing the T's. And Anne's going to quickly go through just some of the basics of the plan so you can get familiar with it. And we'll then turn it over to Harry at Fire Blinder Bell to go through some of the more details of the architecture. I really just want to say once again how honored and thankful I am to get to work with the town on its downtown. It's a spectacular place. Our goal is to make it better in anything we do and to keep its great tradition together. So Anne, take it away, please. Thank you, Richard. Um, I wanted to highlight the quote at the top of this slide. Um, it really, it's pulled from the master plan and it really um, speaks to um, why there's such a great opportunity here. Um, being near transit and being a transit oriented development is uh, really the, the best way to um, develop around a train station today. Um, and we also wanna enhance the downtown, as Richard said, that's really central to our um, planning philosophy. So, and we're also um, uh, find that strategic mixed use is a critical part of successful development. So we really feel like our goals here are really well aligned with the towns and it's gonna make for a really um, robust and successful project in Westfield. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so just to uh, revisit where we are today, um, the red dashed line is the um, uh, extents of the overall project. Um, so it includes parcels that we're proposing buildings on as well as um, the extents of all of the uh, public improvements package that will be funded by the pilot. Um, as you can see, um, there's a lot of surface parking. Again, we think this is a really great opportunity to um, take some of that um, flat space and uh, turn it into something that's much more vibrant um, and really serves the downtown, um, both in its physical manif manifestation as well as um, as an economic driver for the town. Um, next slide. And then um, this is our proposal, uh, a really sort of a high level view and a diagram of what, we, um, what we're proposing here. So the colors represent different uses. So blue is office, yellow is residential, red is retail. And then the, the gray is the um, proposed uh, structured parking, uh, public parking. Um, first and foremost, we understand we're taking over some um, surface parking areas and 
commuter parking and public parking are very important uses in the town and we are not taking those away. We are simply reorganizing them uh, largely in the same locations that they exist today with a little bit of a redistribution. So a little bit more balance between um, the north and the south side, which we think will actually work better. Um, and then we're proposing a mix of uses. And the uh, reason for the mix of uses is again, to support the town um, in multiple ways. Um, and it really goes back to the master plan as well. So with the residential, um, various types of residential that are desperately needed that don't exist today in locations that are gonna be really um, well-received, walkable to the train station, um, and just providing alternatives for people that they've been asking for. Um, the offices, um, we're not uh, centralizing all of the square footage of office on one site. We're splitting it into two different zones. Um, so that's gonna enable us to provide two sort of distinct products to go out to market with. Um, it also helps us manage some of the impacts. So not all of the office traffic is going to one specific part of town. Um, so we really think that the um, arrangement of the office and the overall plan makes a lot of sense. And and can I just stop you on that one because someone yeah. did send a question. Why you know why did you choose why did you choose the Lord and Taylor site um, for residential when it could be office? Why is the most speculative site not on your own property since you're bullish? Well, uh, you just answered a little bit, but I'll just also say um, that uh, the town fought very hard for office on the south side too, if you remember. And going back to wanting to ensure that we had um, employees that were easy accessible to the downtown that could frequent and support our businesses um, uh, during the day. And that's not something that you could guarantee with residential. So uh, I think, uh, so it was for the reasons that you described and mitigating the uh, you know office impact in two places, but also it was really important that we created an, an accessible place for employees to support our downtown businesses and really particularly on the South side as well, so. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I think it's such a prime location for office. Um, as Doug mentioned, we feel very strongly about it. Um, I think this is also a good time to, well, with, the, with regard, I'll finish with the retail. Um, our retail proposal is quite modest. Uh, the existing Lord and Taylor is over 100, 140 some odd thousand square feet. Um, and what we're proposing in total and across the um, three zones is about 27,000 square feet of retail. And it's intended to be um, street retail. Um, it'll activate the street, create a more walkable environment. And um, it's really intended to feed into this uh, mixed use plan that's all in support of the existing downtown. And, um, and I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but this is another question we get. Maybe this might be more of a question for Doug is one of the questions we get is, you know, why are you putting in any retail um, and is it gonna compete? And I think you just answered it as, it as it relates to activation, but I also think it's important to know as property owners of all the retail, you are also be in a position to curate the retail as opposed to the situation we have in our downtown now with all these independent property owners and there's no way to make, you know, when someone says there's four yogurt shops within three blocks of each other, we're not, no one is able to do that, but you would be in a position to curate the retail, not only to be supportive of your own properties, but also to make sure it's additive to the existing businesses downtown. Is that an accurate statement, Doug? Yeah, there's there's sort of two sides. Absolutely, that side, we, we curate it to bring the right retail and the right mix to the office daytime population and the residents uh, generate more demand than the retail we're providing. So there's still projected uh, spillover to the existing businesses downtown. And really lastly, from a, a planning point of view, and I'll send it back to Ann, the street retail is critically important on doing two things, activating the street to make it lively uh, and part of the downtown. Uh, that's what makes it different than perhaps than a single family neighbor, neighborhood. And it also hides the parking. One of the things that we believe in and the town insisted on was that the parking for the private improvements not be visible or fronting on the streets and the retail 
serves to activate the street, create that environment of the pelvic realm that ties everything together and it hides the parking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also just want to mention, um, we've looked a lot at all of the other projects going on um, in nearby neighborhoods. Um, and one in particular that we think is um, quite successful and um, similar in a lot of ways to what we're proposing here is Cranford Crossing. Um, it includes a municipal garage as well as um, a 50 plus uh, foot tall residential building with uh, retail lining the, the ground level. Um, and uh, it seems to be quite well received um, and it's a really uh, positive uh, force in the Cranford community. I think so, Anne, I'll just elaborate on that because a lot of people for a long time, certainly not since I've been in office, have talked about, look what Cranford's done, look what Cranford's done, and their downtown is vibrant. And they started their redevelopment, I think it was in the early to mid 90s, and Cranford Crossing was one of them. I think the big difference, I think you're right, um, it's it's comparable in terms of what it's done to learn with parking and vibrancy and mixed use and so forth. But I think what is different, if I recall, there, there aren't step backs, I think, in that building. I think it's just right. a straight up, is that correct? It's got a so, bit of a pitched roof, but yeah, it's it's kind of it's, right it's at like the- it, it's, it's right at the core. It's the sheer up, wall right along the- Sheer street. wall. And so I think it's important to note what the benefits of that have been to Cranford from a revitalization standpoint, but also what we're, we're anticipating doing a bit differently to make sure that we maintain pro that lower scale charm, I presume, is that correct? Yep, that's correct. And just yeah. for example, on the South Avenue retail, we do have uh, a, a significant setback uh, of the building above. So it really um, reflects what's happening on the South side of the street, keeps it to that neighborhood scale as you're experiencing the sidewalk. And, and I'm sorry to keep it up because I think there's another really important point that I kind of, I learned and intuitively it makes sense, but the issues with um, when you have, what it happens to one street, one street retail, when you have retail on one side and the other side is vacant. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Why that's, I mean, why that's bad. And in this case, we have our South Avenue side retailers across a, a parking lot. Yeah, it's it all comes down to uh, the pedestrian experience and the comfort of um, kind of being in that space. Um, right now, if you're walking along South Avenue, you have uh, some really great little stores and restaurants on one side and your opposite you is a, a huge parking lot. Um, so you don't feel protected from the train. Um, you don't feel like you have um, this uh, sort of outdoor room um, to sort of um, do your errands and, and hang out in. Um, once we sort of double load the South Avenue corridor, um, we're gonna have generous sidewalks. Uh, that double loaded uh, feeling makes it feel more contained and more hospitable, really. Thank you. Okay, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so as Richard was saying, um, the, uh, whole project gets tied together with the public improvements and the experience of the pedestrian or the bicyclist. Um, so we've put a lot of um, energy and attention into um, what that should be, what that should look like. So um, we're really focused on the greening of Westfield. Uh, we have over 200 tr street trees proposed as part of the project. Um, there will be uh, improvements to the sidewalks, lighting, um, all with the goal of creating um, connections between our sites and the downtown, making pedestrian um, circulation safe um, and um, just enhancing the overall experience. Um, so in addition to the physical improvements to the sidewalks, um, there'll be a number of um, traffic improvements, which are not only aimed at uh, vehicular improvements, they're aimed at uh, making it safer for pedestrians to walk around town. And we think those are incredibly important. Um, again, those all lead to these uh, larger central 
open spaces, which are critical to the plan, which are what will be programmed and activated and really provide um, this key uh, public open space that's really missing in the heart of Westfield right now. Um, go to the next slide. I just wanna highlight, um, since we've been out in the community for several months um, talking and several years really, um, collecting feedback, uh, we have recently um, released a series of changes we've made to the plan um, and two that really are um, very architectural are um, the change from uh, a multifamily building to townhouses on the uh, residential site at the corner of Clark and North, which is sort of the Northeast corner of the Lord and Taylor zone. And then the reduction of the office on South Avenue by a floor. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those. Fire Blunder Bell will be uh, taking us into a little bit more detail there. Um, and hopefully you'll enjoy what they have to say. So without further ado, um, Harry from BBB is here to take us through um, some of the design process and, and detail that we've been um, working on to date. Great, thank you, Anne. Good evening, everybody. My name is Harry Peltz. I'm from Buyer Blinder Bell. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Actually, one more, thank you. Great. Um, a little background on our firm. BBB was founded in 1968 and has three offices, New York City, Boston, and Washington, DC. It's a staff of over 170. Um, our mission is the lasting regeneration of our built environment, responsive, informed, and public-minded design and planning that respects the context and the spirit of history. Our firm is a leader in preservation, adaptive reuse, and new architecture in historical or sensitive districts. And I've included just a few examples of this type of work, um, such as the adaptive reuse of the Hens department store in Newark, uh, which you see on the left, a new residential building in historic Georgetown, which are the two images in the bottom and the right, and a new residential building on the campus of the General Theological Seminary in New York City. Uh, next slide, please. So our firm mission of preservation, adaptive reuse, and new architecture in historical or sensitive districts informs our design process. So we always approach each project with the respect for the surrounding context, and let that influence and inspire our designs. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at Westfield's rich character. It's civic and institutional buildings, it's active downtown, it's natural and curated parks, and it's iconic buildings of the past, such as the Lord and Taylor building pictured center screen. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of Westfield civic and institutional buildings that have inspired us and formed our design. These buildings are examples of utilizing rich and timeless materials and detailing that you will see echoes of in the design process, especially in the case of the First United Methodist Church, which you see on the upper left, and the YMCA that you see in the right. Next slide, please. Some examples here of Westfield's vibrant and active downtown. It was important to the team to provide a strong connection to the commercial corridor and the proposed development. This will be key to the growth and future of the community. You can see here the transparency and openness of the storefronts to the streetscape and surrounding sidewalks. This will inform the proposed retail design process as we move forward. So you can see in some of these images what we're talking about here. Next slide, please. So a look at some of Westfield's rich parks that green the area. It really is a wide range of parks that inspired our thinking as architects and planners. From the more curated and structured parks you see on the right to the more organic parks you see on the left. You will see moving forward an emphasis on promoting walkability and connectivity through the widening and shading of sidewalks to creating a variety of public parks, greens, and plazas for the public of Westfield to enjoy. Next slide. 
and go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, so if we take a step back for a moment, we can talk about all these elements and how they come together. Everything begins with the train station that you see kind of in the center of those two circles um, and downtown at the core. This radiates outwards to form gateways, which you see circled in yellow, those little sunbursts on the west and east sides of North Avenue and along East and West Broad Streets. As you can see, the proposed development highlighted in red will serve as both connection and gateway, tying this all together. Let's go to the next slide. So this slide speaks to the new structures and public spaces that will be provided throughout the site. This will enhance walkability with a reconnected pedestrian network and new outdoor experiences, as well as the a new arrival experiences at the train station that the was that the uh, team mentioned previously. Okay, next slide. Here we have the new additions to the public realm. It will reinforce the connections and gateways we spoke about earlier. So shaded sidewalks, garden stoops, pocket gardens, pedestrian plazas, pedestrian streets, town greens, and town squares just dispersed evenly around the project. Next slide, please. This slide speaks to the variety of streetscapes provided, ranging from more private areas like pocket parks and garden seating to more public zones such as plaza cafes. This we feel will promote a pedestrian friendly lifestyle all while connecting and greening downtown Westfield. And uh, this kind of reinforces what Anne really laid down previously. Next slide, please. Along these public zones, we will take cues from downtown Westfield and provide new ground floor experiences. Here's an example of the adaptive reuse of the iconic Lord and Taylor building with new and engaging transparent indoor outdoor retail. This will activate North Avenue and connect it back to the existing downtown retail zone. Next slide. As mentioned on the previous slide, here you can see a variety of ways to create a transparent and dynamic storefront that will enhance and promote a vibrant streetscape and sidewalk experience of the residents of Westfield, such as operable or walk-up storefronts, vibrant window displays, et cetera. Okay, next slide. All right. And here's a refresher of Westfield's architectural and natural characteristics again. It's civic and institutional buildings, it's active downtown, it's natural and curated parks, and it's iconic buildings of the past, such as the Lord and Taylor building. Next slide. And the fabric of Westfield architecture. We see examples of utilizing rich and timeless materials and detailing that you will see echoes of in the design process. Next slide. Okay, uh, go back please, one slide. Now let's talk about each element of the proposal. Let's begin with the former Lord and Taylor building on North Avenue. You can see it highlighted here. Next slide. As you can see in the highlighted model shot found at the previous center, we're proposing an adaptive reuse of the former Lord and Taylor building which will contain 100,000 square feet of office, 13,000 square feet of retail, and 20,000 square feet of amenity, which will be on top of the building and will be connected to the residential building to the east and west. Next slide. Here's a before and after shot of the existing building and empty surface lots as you will find it today at the top image. And the proposed retail pictured at the bottom we discussed previously. This will really enhance the streetscape of North Avenue. If any of you walk this portion of the site, I'm sure you will agree it is not pedestrian friendly. Next slide. Moving on to the residences, these will be situated to the east and west of Lord and Taylor. You can see them highlighted here. Next slide. And here is a before and after shot of the existing Lord and Taylor building and empty lots, as you will find it today. 
and the proposed residential buildings highlighted to the east and the west. These residences will provide 138 units serving the 55 and older demographic. Next slide. I'd like to pause here to talk about the design process and some of the tools that we can use to break down the massing. As you can see from the images below, we can utilize variations in the facade, moving in and out and setting back, creating layering of materials and surface plans. All of these tools help the new building fit into the scale and context that surrounds it. Next slide. Another design tool to break up the massing is to utilize step backs on the upper stories of the building. Take a look at the section diagram in the upper right hand corner. We will set the street wall back and enlarge the sidewalks, which gives us the opportunity to introduce new green streetscapes with pocket parks, shaded sidewalks, and gardens. This will not only break down the vertical massing, but promote the walkability and connectivity to downtown that we spoke about earlier. Next slide. As mentioned previously, this is a process and the design is ever evolving. Having said that, materiality can also be a design tool to create that variation in the facade to break down the massing that we spoke about before. Some materials that we could use, stone, metal, brick, and wood, just to name a few. Next slide, please. Okay. Moving on to the townhouses. These will be situated across the street from the Lord and Taylor building. You can see them highlighted here. Next slide. And here's a before and after shot of the North Avenue townhouse site. You can see the roof of the existing Lord and Taylor right across the street, across North Avenue. These will be 16 units and will also serve the 55 and older demographic. Next slide, please. In the rendering in the middle, you can see the North Avenue townhouses to the left. And further east, you will notice the site of the Clark and North townhouses, which we'll touch on later. The surrounding precedent images show the variety of townhouse design tools and materiality we could utilize in the design process moving forward, such as stoops, bay windows, brick, and wood detailing. Combined with vertical and horizontal setbacks, we feel the streetscape along North Avenue will really be enriched, all while fitting nicely into the surrounding context. Next slide. As discussed previously, materiality can also be a design tool, creating a variety in the facade using color, shadow lines, and texture. Some materials and details that could be used, again, are stone, metal, brick, and wood. As an example, you can look at the variety of texture we can achieve uh, just by varying the brick and the detailing. Next slide. Moving on to the townhouses at Clark and North. You can see them highlighted here. Next slide. Here is the site on North Avenue and Clark Street. As you can see, it is situated between the YMCA to the north and the First United Methodist Church to the east. And off the screen to the south, you can see the Memorial Park. Next slide. As we mentioned at the top of the presentation, this is a process. And part of that process is listening to your feedback. So here you can see on the left, the previous scheme showing a much larger market rate multifamily residential building, which is a continuous massing fronting Clark and North. And on the right, after listening to your feedback, we were tasked with looking at reducing the massing fronting Clark and North and introducing 16 units of townhouses split into three volumes. Next slide. So here you can see on the left, the previous scheme showing that larger massing. And on the right, the 16 units of townhouses split into three separate volumes. The new scheme, as you will see in the following slides, will allow us to create a larger connection to the surrounding context, and again, introduce new green spaces and streetscapes, serving as a connection and gateway to North Avenue and downtown Westfield. 
Next slide. This slide shows the context surrounding the site as talked about on the site plan. The YMCA to the north, which is the uh, bottom left, and the church to the east and Memorial Park to the south. Here at BBB, part of our mission is to approach each project with respect for the surrounding context and let that influence and inspire our designs. Please take note of the materials you see here, the stately gray stone of the church and the brick you see at the YMCA. Next slide. Here are some examples of how we can take a cue from the red brick of the YMCA and the stone from the church. We can pair those with complementary and perhaps more contemporary materials like metals and woods to create a harmonious design that is of its time, but respectful to its context. Next slide. Actually, go to the next slide, please. Here we have a perspective view looking northeast along North Avenue. You can see on the left side how the context of the YMCA with its red brick facade can inform the materiality and detailing of the townhouses along Clark Street. And if you look to the right side of the image, you will see how the stone of the church beyond informs the townhouses along North. We think this is a great statement of how we can respect the history and context of Westfield, but at the same time, move it forward with harmonious design. Next slide. And here's a perspective view at the corner of Clark and North Avenue, where the two townhouse volumes intersect. We have created a pocket park that is directly across North Avenue from Memorial Park. So in essence, it is an extension of the public streetscape and serves as a gateway into the townhouses portion of the development. You can also see how all the materials that we spoke about previously come together in harmony, brick, stone, wood, and metal. Next slide. And finally, a perspective along Clark Street looking south to Memorial Park behind, beyond. Here you can see the culmination of all the design tools we spoke about previously using the step backs, the ins and outs, volumes, layering of materials and detail to create a pleasing facade that sits in and relates to the surrounding context of Westfield. Next slide. Moving on to the lofts on central and north, you can see them highlighted. Next slide. Above, you can see the existing site for the lofts, which is now empty surface lots. Here we will provide 35 residential units with 2,100 square feet of retail. The building will be influenced by a more contemporary and industrial aesthetic. You can see some precedent images below that shows some of the detailing and materiality we could take cues from. Because of the unique geometry of the site, we can create a large pocket park at the intersection and utilize an open and active corner retail strategy that will again enrich and connect the streetscapes of surrounding downtown Westfield, all while extending and connecting the wide walkable streets. Next slide. Again, materiality is detail tool creating a variety in the facade using color, shadow lines, and texture, some materials and details that could be used, stone, metal, brick, and wood in various palettes. Next slide. And I, I'm sorry, before you leave that, Harry, sure. just a reminder, those re loft residents mask the parking garage behind it. So I didn't know if that was obvious to people. It may oh, yes. go back to the, to the pre yeah. just point that out. Slide 55, I believe. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so if you could point that out. I don't, <clears throat> in the upper right-hand corner. Right, Yeah, yes. exactly, thank you. So no, I think that's a really important feature. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, let's flip forward a couple to the south office buildings. Okay, so you can see that highlighted in the lower right-hand corner of the diagram. Next slide. Okay, so here we have a before and after shot. Surface parking lots, as you'll find it today. The proposed south office buildings below sheet, 
And of course, this is directly adjacent to the train station. So we're proposing 210,000 square feet of office space and 12,000 square feet of retail. Next slide, please. So as we touched upon before, this is an ongoing process. And part of that process is listening to your feedback. So here you can see on the left, the previous scheme, and on the right, the current proposed scheme. We're removing the upper story. We're reducing the height from 75 feet to 65 feet. The height of the retail is 20 feet. And the height of the street wall is 65 feet. And the large sidewalk width will vary from 15 feet to 21 feet wide. So Harry, just going back mm -hmm. to where you started, probably back with the Lord and Taylor. So, you know, obviously height has been a real big concern for um, many residents in the area and some others. So, uh, so the reduction of that, of that floor, I think was very well received. But talk about, again, that pedestrian experience um, and what that experience will be relative to the, what, are you, is it just gonna feel like you're walking down like a main street with retail on either side? Like how imposing will the subsequent floors be? Um, you know, how urban, if you will, if, you, if that's the right word, will it feel? Mm -hmm. Right, so let's skip ahead to the next slide because I think we have some images describing just that. So let's see here. So just like the Lord and Taylor Street uh, site to the west, this slide speaks to the variety of streetscapes we can bookend and connect the development with, ranging from town greens and plaza cafes to a pedestrian street fronted by ground level retail. And all of this connects directly to downtown and the train station. So this will, we feel will promote a pedestrian friendly lifestyle and serve as the future gateway to downtown Westfield. And you can really see from some of these, you know, the imagery uh, surrounding the main rendering, you know, when you're looking at it from the street, it's really activated. You're not looking at just a massive flat building that has no depth or variety of materials and design. Um, it's a really active and lively street, and there's going to be um, a design to this thing. It's going to have uh, depth and personality um, and really reinforce the character of Westfield. And Mayor, if I could jump into this, Doug, the <clears throat> one distinctive thing here as well is that immediately above the retail level is a setback that isn't common on most other buildings to create that the, the office uh, portion will be set back even further than the 15 foot wide uh, minimum sidewalks that, that the retail is set back from the street. And, and Doug, people still get stuck on, which is, I, I, it, it's easily understandable to me, but still get stuck on the fact that there's 12,000 square feet of retail here. Uh, it, it, again, can you explain what that does to activate the street and how that will help our other businesses downtown? And I yeah. think it goes without saying what it's going to do for the South Avenue businesses. Sure, there's a, a pretty overwhelmingly um, understood that a two-sided retail street is almost invariably more successful than a one-sided uh, and creates uh, an environment and alluded to where you feel like you're you're in an environment it's what makes the existing downtown work so well is every street in downtown westfield in the traditional downtown is two-sided retail and it's important that when you're standing on one side you can look across the street and see the retail there as well. I think there was a gentleman that spoke Tuesday night at the council who owns one of those businesses and said that being across the street from a parking lot is not the benefit you would think of. He's had to go to delivery only because the people that are over there parking in there don't feel safe to walk across the street as much as he would like. And the people on this side, um, uh, you, you know, don't have an environment that's inviting to sit out, eat outside in front of his restaurant, et cetera, or his business. Um, and I think that he was more uh, very eloquent on his real world struggles with uh, the retail down there. Yeah, I think I think currently South Avenue is not a place you would stroll. It's a place, it's like a destination that you do something and then you leave. So I think the idea is you're saying two-sided street. And I'm sorry, Harry, before going back to you, because I, I am getting questions that are being forwarded to me. 
And um, going back to someone was challenging when I mentioned, you know, I fought for office space and that was, it was in indicating that this notion that resident, that employees actually do things during mm -hmm. their lunch break is old school. But what, what was the quote here? Um, how it's an, is as antiquated as brick and mortar retail. Well, um, I couldn't say farther from the truth. I can only know when I worked in New York City, uh, I went to the dentist, I got my hair done. I did, I did got my, had my accountant there. Every single thing I did was related to what I could do on my lunch hour. And here in Westfield, mm -hmm. I know when Lerner David left, for example, the chiropractor told me he lost tons of clients from Lerner David who came to him during his lunch hour. Um, if you talk to Lillian Pien, the owner of Akai, she catered all of their parties and lunches and lost that business when they left. So um, the, the ecosystem uh, that these office employees create isn't just about what even they're doing from 12 to one. It's about the, the businesses that they're supporting for all of their events and so forth uh, beyond. So, um, so I obviously very disagree adamantly with that comment. Um, and I think if anything, uh, and I, I, I assume your experience would support that, Doug. Yeah, our office is in the office four days a week. Uh, we flex out one day a week. Um, and I think we're finding that more and more typical from our sister companies and others. And I can tell you um, that a very small number of folks bring their own lunches or eat. We have a small cafe in the office to pick a snack up, but uh, are going downstairs and out to eat. They run errands, et cetera. Um, and I think that um, will continue and we believe it will continue. Um, so, um, so we digress, sorry, Harry, we'll go back to you. No, that's fine. Those are all great points. Thank you. Okay, so um, let's actually go to the next slide where we're nearing the end. Okay, so this will also be New Jersey's first mass timber building reinforcing the emphasis of sustainability. So here's some precedent images of other mass timber office buildings from around the country that have inspired us. Next slide, please. And here are some of the benefits of CLT construction, which stands for cross laminated timber construction. This will be a marriage of solid timber, concrete, steel, and glass and as I said, the first of its kind in New Jersey. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Chris at Topology who will walk you through the approvals process. So I just want to thank everybody for their time. Thanks, Harry. Before we go back to Chris, I just wanted to, to interject, um, and this is uh, stated um, out there, it's personal for me. Um, I'm a firm believer in CLT and mass timber buildings. I think they're incredibly beautiful. I've toured any number of them uh, on the West Coast and in Canada. And to me, they ring all the right bells for what the world and, and uh, ESG and companies uh, are looking for. And they're beautiful, not only from the inside, uh, but what you see through and on the outside. And, you know, they're coming, the building codes have been modified uh, to uh, allow them now. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, looking forward to taking advantage of that. Okay, great. Right. Thanks, Doug. If you could advance to the next slide if we're ready. Thanks. Uh, okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Colley. I'm a redevelopment planner uh, with Topology. We are the redevelopment planners um, for the town. Of Westfield. Um, and I thought that it would make sense for us to close at least the presentation portion of, of the material this evening by talking a little bit about process, uh, where we are in the process, like where we're going in the process, um, what's coming next. Uh, you know, it's important, I think, for, for everyone uh, in, in town and, you know, the elected officials, citizens, everyone to understand sort of uh, where decisions are made, um, what votes mean what, what documents mean what, um, and, and how things uh, evolve. Uh, you've seen a lot of images today, some very detailed, some very uh, conceptual, and I really want to sort of frame that in terms of the, the, the big picture redevelopment process. So if you can go to the next slide. 
Great, thanks. Um, so there's really four big steps in, in the redevelopment implementation process. Um, and, I'll, and I'll touch on all of them and then we'll use an example to, to provide a little context, um, put a little meat on the bone of that. You know, as Don said in the beginning, uh, the, the redevelopment process really has to start um, with the master plan. Uh, your master plan includes a lot of recommendations that are specific uh, to redevelopment, um, in addition to sort of general goals, objectives, and a vision. And it's really the role um, of the of the town to to create a redevelopment plan that that reflects that vision. Um, one of the questions uh, that was asked earlier dealt with you know the fifty five feet and um, how that related to the redevelopment process. Um, you know, there is a recommendation in the master plan for the whole CBD to go to 55 feet, but there are also a number of different recommendations specific to redevelopment and specific to these sites about exploring the possibility for greater heights or number of stories on the redevelopment sites, uh, recommendations specific uh, to Lord and Taylor site, uh, specific to the South Zone, um, really identifying those as places uh, that might have, just to quote, heights and, and floors exceeding um, the rest of downtown Westfield. So there's a lot of grounding for the planning uh, that happens happens there. Um, you know, the planning departments all over are filled with unimplemented master plans, um, but, but the redevelopment plan is, is really the next step uh, in terms of implementing those recommendations, uh, if it's gonna be a redevelopment project. And in the redevelopment plan, which would be the next step in this process and, you know, would be, um, forthcoming, you, uh, you're sort of becoming more detailed in terms of what uh, parameters you're setting around development. If the master plan sets a broad vision, the redevelopment plan starts to establish uh, lines uh, which need to be drawn within. So in a redevelopment plan, you would find uh, locations of permitted land uses, right? Where's the office going to be? Where's the residential going to be? How much of it? Uh, bulk standards, how tall are the buildings going to be? Where are they going to be set back from um, property lines, from curb lines? Uh, what's the permitted coverage of the site? Typical zoning standards that you would see if you opened up um, zoning ordinances uh, anywhere. What it also allows you to do, though, and what you'll you'll see um, in redevelopment plans typically is to specify public improvements that are important and to put some detail onto those public improvements. Uh, so in this case, obviously, priority public improvements are the plazas on both sides, uh, the sidewalk improvements, um, the, the Quimby improvements, um, and so on. And also to put additional detail on design standards. Um, the redevelopment process allows you to get more specific in terms of um, uh, articulation of buildings, uh, massing of buildings, uh, design of landscapes, putting more detailed standards in place uh, than you'd otherwise find under zoning. Um, so while that said, like while the redevelopment plan does become more specific than the master plan, it really does set lines um, within which to draw, there's a lot of more detailed design work that has to happen after that process, after that point. And that is typically uh, contained within the redevelopment agreement, which would be the next step in the process and ultimately site plan. So if, if the plan, if the redevelopment plan is going to establish uses and bulks, standards and things of that nature, the redevelopment agreement is going to add layers of detail onto that, right? Um, going to show how buildings might actually be masked, uh, how the buildings might be laid out, um, uh, more detailed project information, as it says here, about different features, uh, implementation timelines, really a contract between the town and the redeveloper for, for implementation of a specific project. Uh, but even then, the design work and the project work is really not finished. Um, I think a lot of times when people think about buildings and approvals, they're thinking about materials in, in great detail, they're thinking about uh, window placements, um, they're thinking about uh, how's the stormwater going to work out? Um, can the trucks make that turn, right? Uh, how's a fire truck going to get in there? And those types of ultimate details are really worked out at the planning board, whether in a redevelopment project um, such as this one or in, in a standard project, uh, sort of standard planning or zoning board project. And that's at the site plan approval process. And that's, that's sort of the, the capstone of the, of the approvals. 
um, and, and is the thing that you have in place before you actually start to build. So before, before we go to the next slide, just, just sort of, so we're all clear. Um, we have a master plan in place, moving towards a redevelopment plan. But um, even if we get through that redevelopment plan process, uh, ultimately many details remain to be worked out at the agreement and the site plan phase. Uh, you can move on. So I just thought it was worth it um, to, to give one like actual concrete example as to like how a specific project component might evolve throughout this process. Uh, so, you know, this could apply really to anything, to the design of the plazas or to the design of one particular building, but um, chose to illustrate it through streetscapes. Um, the streetscape design, much like anything else, would evolve through a process, right? So if you go to your land use and circulation master plan right now, what you'll see is um, the, the breakdown of downtown into several types of streets and sort of general recommendations about what the dimensions of sidewalks should be on those streets, uh, what types of things there should be, recommendations about trees here or planters there or trash cans there, really sort of a broad geographic area with general recommendations and a vision for, for the streetscape. When we get beyond the master plan process and get into the redevelopment plan process, what you'll see are more specific standards for more targeted geographical areas. So typically in our redevelopment plans, you would see that the sidewalks on whatever, uh, Main Street, I know it's on a Main Street, uh, would be a minimum of 12 feet, right? And that sidewalk would be breaking up, broken up into, into several features. So sort of setting more detailed parameters. Um, and then, as I said, like as you get into the redevelopment agreement and the site plan approval, you start to transition from the idea of having standards and parameters to having much more in the way of drawings and details. So as you would go into the RDA, you might see conceptual diagrams showing how North Avenue's sidewalk layout might actually work out, um, how the planter zone along the new South Ave sidewalk would be laid out relative to the places where pedestrians are, relative to where outdoor dining might happen, and more information about um, if there's going to be benches, like what those benches might look like. Right? But only when we get to the site plan approval process are you going to be able to um, sort of have a firm and final understanding of like, this is exactly precisely the boundaries of how the streetscape is going to look. And that's the model of bench we picked, right? And that's the um, lamp post that's being utilized. And this is how stormwater is going to run off and all of those sorts of engineering and more detailed um, components. So as I said, like this sort of bigger picture, uh, this sort of process of moving from generality of recommendations to specificity of approvals really applies to all, all components of the project. And it's worth keeping that in mind uh, as you sort of process a lot of the design information that was presented by Harry and Ann and Richard uh, and Doug and, and, and others um, throughout their presentation this evening. So that's it for me, you can go to the next slide. All right, so uh, you know what? We're trying to wrap by eight. It's a few minutes for, but I do. I just want to run through some questions that have come through some previously, and I'm sorry, I don't know if these are going to be in any particular order. Uh, some came in in advance, so I, let me get to those first. Uh, actually, Richard Heaps, I think you're probably the right person to answer this. What is a snick away? And um, yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I know you could go on and on, but you could give us the abbreviated answer for that. You're on mute, Richard. Huh. How's that? Sorry. There you go. Uh, I'll give you uh, uh, the abbreviated answer. This is something I learned working on Westfield. Snickleways were developed in the 1600s in several of the towns outside of London. And they're very narrow passageways between blocks that you could walk through and navigate around town. How does this relate to Westfield? Well, oddly enough, uh, Westfield has the emergence or the possibility of Snickleways. You'll see one next to the Rialto going back to the parking. And if you follow the little alleyways throughout the downtown, you can actually almost have a secondary passage of walking from parking to street, to adjacent street. I've done a map not related to this that shows how you could actually have a secondary system of walking 
from parking space in the middle of the block to adjacent streets throughout all of downtown. Uh, why am I excited about this? Well, it turns out Palm Beach has something similar, but there's not another town in the United States that I know that has anything like this. And I have suggested, including in our plan, that that may be a way to redevelop for pedestrianism only to walk throughout the downtown where you can cut through a block, et cetera. So I stole the name from this town outside of London and I'm just captivated by it. And when I go to Westfield, I'm always taking a cut, a shortcut through one of the alleys that could be potential snickleways. And the proposal that we're talking about specifically, a lot of people remember it. It's that one between the brick oven and the um, yes. liquor basket. And people used to use this cutway for the back parking lot and then it got closed off. But we've actually right. are working on reopening it. And one of those, the very, the snickle way would be a component of the Quimby redesign that, and enable correct. you to access link to go cut through there back to the parking lot and, and over to North Avenue and greater access to the parking garage and everything else. So better pedestrian and could be uniquely Westfields. <clears throat> right. I think we had tentatively called it Peter, uh, Quimby's Way. Um, yes. Okay, another one from Peter. He wanted to know, has an observation tower or sky bridge between North and South Side been considered? And also just at the South Side Park, what do you say, begs a fountain. <laughs> so any comments on that? Uh, sure, we did look at um, a sky bridge over the railroad tracks. You know, um, there's complications of approval, you know, there are with everything. I think the biggest thing was how best to um, focus resources. A sky bridge, because it needs to be fully ADA compliant and have a lot of standards to cross the railroad tracks would be really expensive. And devoting a, a fraction of that resources on making the existing um, connection that goes under, uh, and the connection uh, under the road on the other side and the one at the stations was a better use and more bang for the buck uh, than trying to build something over the tracks. And a fountain on the South Green, anybody have a comment? I assume he means the South Green when he says the South Park. I assume that's the one he's referring to. Yeah, we um, can go ahead, Richard. I was gonna say, uh, we're happy to look at, at fountains. Fountains are complicated in the north because during a certain parts of the year, they don't really run, uh, but there's no, I think it's a good point that fountains are places to gather around, do things around. I can't see why we wouldn't look at that. And I think it's a great idea. All right, okay. So um, Doug, I think this one might be for you. If this is approved, can you outline when we will potentially see shovels? I'm done looking at the Lord and Taylor site, especially. Please do this. So what does a timing look like with sh shovels in the ground? Sure. Um, I think Chris did a good job laying that. Once we um, get through these first stages, then we need to do the more, much more detailed um, documentation. Uh, for the design for site plan approval. We do that uh, as part of the public-private process as well uh, with the community. That can take nine to 12 months to move through just getting documentation ready. So you're looking about a year or so to get that last step of approvals after these first steps, uh, and then probably another six to nine months to get in the ground. So uh, we would hope to be in the ground within two years. Within two years. Um, and and then from the time you're in the ground, because I think some this other question said, um, I've heard seven years is so what's the time from shovel in the ground at Lord and Taylor to potential completion of the whole project? And I think the concern there for a lot is, you know, is this town going to be one big construction project for decades? So the answer is no, we, we we focus a lot of attention and expertise on the construction side. If people remember the project goes from the west to the north to the south in terms of geographic layout and the phasing is somewhat uh, similar, it, it doesn't make sense from um, just risk and from an impact point of view to do it all at once. 
So it, it um, is basically a, um, two sort of overlapping builds. The West starts so that everybody, including the town, is sure that the project's committed, it's underway, there's millions of dollars invested, et cetera. And then before that's completed, we then start on the North Garage uh, and then move to the South as the pre-leasing and that garage gets finished. Total build out, probably about 30 months and 30 months overlapping for a total of five years. And and they'll be fairly discrete projects. I mean, right, yeah. I mean, because the so it'll, it, the north side and then we'll be done and then the south side. So it's not, it won't be impacting the entire town simultaneously. That's correct. And, and a lot of that five years in the different components is when you're inside the building. So yes, at some point you're rebuilding mm -hmm. sidewalks, you're building intersections, doing those things, which will, um, there's some discomfort as those improvements are put in place. But then there's a lot of work in the residential buildings and the office buildings inside the buildings uh, after the corn shell is done. So it's it's sort of a blend, Mayor. Got it. And um, Don, I think this is a question for you. And it I said, um, it seems like the entire master plan re-examination was done to conform to Streetworks plans for one Westfield place. So again, was the roadmap driven by the master plan re-examination or written to conform to their proposal? No, I mean, it's the planning board that adopts the master plan. So, so the re-exam and the public uh, outreach process inform the re-exam, which in turn inform the master plan, right? Now, all stakeholders were involved in putting this together. Yes, street work was spoken with as a stakeholder in town during the creation of the unified land use and circulation plan, but really- Along, not, with, along, with, all, along with all the property owners. Along with DWC, downtown right. property owners, and then you right. go even further back with the, the re-exam. You had, as I mentioned earlier, senior citizens groups, you had uh, um, all, right. all the meetings that were up on that slide. So, but to say that it was driven by Streetworks, no, not at all. Um, Streetworks has to conform to what we were thinking of. And I mentioned earlier how um, during an early meeting with uh, Streetworks, Richard, he mentioned how, oh, your re-exam has the things we're looking for um, in terms of we know that you have this vision for your town and we're not just interested in the Lord and Taylor site. We're interested in your downtown as a whole and what's going to happen there because it, it gets us interested in being a part of that to whatever degree that would be. So but no, to say that Streetworks drove the master plan, no, that's not accurate. I actually think the comment reflects um, how seriously Streetworks took the master plan. Because exactly. as, as we said, and they said, we handed to them as an instruction manual. So, right. um, so, and so, um, okay, let's see, I answered that. Um, okay, answered that. Um, Oh, that, let's see. Um, uh, uh, I, I think maybe, um, Chris, this is for you. It's a process question. It said, when will, when will, do, will they intend to share a floor plan or full building sections that have provided to the model maker and renderer? Is that something that happens in the site plan, in the planning board site plan review? Yeah, a, a full building floor plan and full detailed final building elevations would be a part of a part of the site plan. The site um, you know, the reference to the model, the model's really what we would call a massing plan. It shows uh -huh. height, bulk, and those are types of standards that would be in the redevelopment plan. How tall can the buildings be? Um, how large can they be? Things like that. But the floor plan and so forth, that's a, that's a site plan. That would plan. be a, that would be a site plan. Can I, can I make it? Can I make a quick comment on that? Yeah. Uh, and I got a kick out of the last questions because we are developing the plans as we speak. One of the things we like to do, and I think Westfield deserves this, is to create new models for development. There are no great 55 plus residential buildings out in the universe. It's a new phenomenon. We are working with experts across the country as to how to design those units. 
what do they have? They have larger bedrooms, smaller, more closets, less closets. So uh, I, I don't have those as we speak. I have general square feet. Likewise, how are we going to lay out a mass timber building? It has incredibly different uh, vocabularies and strains, et cetera. So uh, I think uh, our, our notion is this is designed specifically for Westfield. We are not copying some residential project in Texas somewhere or whatever. It is being designed for Westfield, for the people of Westfield in today's uh, stratus. And, and so it's very interesting that way. And uh, I, we're very comfortable that this is the broad spectrum of it, but we are still working on the specifics of those special uses that are one of a kind to Westfield in terms of New Jersey. Thank right. you, Richard. And Harry, uh, one more, maybe, um, Harry, because, you know, I would say there's this general fear, um, you know, some of the comments, uh, even about what you presented, oh, that looks too urban, that looks like Hoboken. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, and I, th I thought you did a really nice job of, you know, talking about the materials and how one informs the other, but you've done a lot You've done a lot of uh, arc, you know, architectural so forth in very context sensitive places, as you mentioned. So, how do you respond to the fear of? And I, I think when people say you turn into Hoboken, I mean, on one hand, that's absurd because you know Hoboken's what one or two square miles with sixty. It's just not even close. But I think right. uh, so. So it's I. So what I read into it is it's. There's this fear of, well, those buildings don't look like what we've known. In your experience, how, how, how do you do that marriage in a way to keep your town, um, you know, uh, re really reflective and, mar and, and wedded to the past, but not constrained by it? And so what assurance can you give to people regarding some of the architecture and so forth that it's going how it will feel and integrate with the rest of the community. Right. I think, <clears throat> again, this is this is a process, right? Um, but I think the part of the presentation that would best illustrate that if you just think back to the Clark and North townhouses, right? How we did the research and we went on the ground and we looked at, at the surrounding context, the YMCA uh, to the north, the church to the east, we looked at those materials that exist already in Westfield that are, that that make up, you know, the culture and the fabric of of Westfield as it is and as it always has been, and reinterpret that through through a filter, right? So it's of now, but it pays respect to the past and it it pays respect to the context in which it sits. So I think you know, we have a lot of experience of adaptive reuse and being very, very sensitive to the history, the culture, the fabric, the traditions of, you know, each town we construct something in. So I think that would be applied across the board to all of these, you know, little sub projects as we call them within this development. Um, you know, the Lord and Taylor residences, Lord and Taylor adaptive reuse itself, the lofts mm -hmm. and so on. I think we would really dig in even further. Um, this is a process, this is preliminary, just as Richard says, I mean, we're still working, we're mm -hmm. still digging in and that will continue as we move forward. Thank you. Um, sure. And so the, re the re I'm sorry, Doug, were you gonna comment? Okay, yeah. the, I was just say the rest of the questions that came in early aren't really related to planning and design. So I'm not gonna really belabor them, but I did just wanna make a few comments in case these people are listening. Um, uh, Mr. Richard sent in a question about parking and um, if there's a, a plan with all the number of spaces pre and post, and there is, if you go onto the parking plan document that's on our website, there's a chart in that parking plan that outlines pre and post parking numbers. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and as someone else asked about the financial obligation of the town, Ms. Allen, I just want to tell you, if you look at, um, uh, both the first and the second presentations of the finance, as well as the presentation that we gave at the council meeting the other night, it answers the question about um, 
what Streetworks obligations are to fulfill their financial duties if anything happens and they go bankrupt or anything else. You address the office space. Um, someone asked about the pilot, concerned about putting the burden on schools unfairly. We address specifically in the financial presentation why pilots were not, this pilot was not going to unburden the school, burden the schools. If anything, could actually benefit the schools. And uh, the last comment: dogs, dog runs are usually in parks. Who thought this would be a good idea? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I think there, I see dog runs everywhere, usually attached to where there's a, a, a number of people. They're also great community gathering spaces. So uh, I don't know if they're um, they're in. I see them in New York City all the time too. So well, um, let me, give me just two seconds, Mayor. That's like uh, yeah, that's like uh, water to a man on the desk. <laughs> because let, let me tell you what. That's a bigger. Remember in my first slide, I said successful downtowns have successful integrated public spaces. And the, the thinking on the dog walk, and I, I'll, I'll take credit for it, and I'm not a particular dog person, is what are all the things that are that you can do in a town when you're walking and connecting and integrating with the town? And you realize the dog walk is across the street from the Lord and Taylor site. We're gonna have some 150 people living there. Uh, with pets living in an apartment like mine do. And one of the things that Dog Walk has, it's maintained. It has fresh supply of trash bags or plastic bags for droppings, except it's managed and it's on the sidewalk. And so you can live here, hop downstairs, and instead of having your dog do its duty in the front yards of everyone along that street, there's a community place, which by the way, oh, you'll meet people. You may say, hey, that's a very community thing. Uh, and uh, really the main thing I'm trying to figure out is what is the name of it? And- Oh, well, that's a, well, that's a good problem to have, so. Uh, but you know uh, what? It's a great example of a community thing where you Agreed. meet with your neighbors. Uh, I'm a big advocate of it. Yeah, me too. Um, well, you know what, that's like a good place to end because it kind of circles back to where we began about public spaces. And uh, I want to thank everybody, Don, Harry, Ann, Doug, Chris, and Richard um, for your contributions today. I hope this was helpful to the public. Uh, again, this will be on, um, on our website and we look forward if you have any other questions, but thanks so much for your time and expertise today. So good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.